<laughs> and uh, so let's begin by praying to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you very much for the very <laughs> blessing you've given to us, the opportunity to pray to God. Right important in the world, but Heavenly Father, we can immediately go into prayer with you. That's overwhelming, Father, the joy that you've given to us. And we pray now, Heavenly Father, as we go into worship, that your spirit will guide us, that it will be a morning that will be glorifying to you, glorifying to your Son. Father, we pray these things in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, would you look in your hymnal and find hymn number 87? Please find hymn 87 with me. Angels from the realms of glory. study of the Word of God with Spring Valley Bible Church. Uh, excited this morning as we're rolling into the, the Christmas season. Um, finished up First Peter last week, or excuse me, Second Peter last week, although I think Phil was trying to teach it again this morning. I, <laughs> just kidding, if you uh, were on this morning, you'll know what we're talking about. But um, Start with uh, some prayer requests this morning. So I'd like to, to lift up Brian and, and Julie. I know they're doing their back and forth with uh, going up to Tulsa. Uh, Brian's mom is in hospice, and you just found out your, your brother has cancer? Uh, he, he just revealed it recently. He's okay. been going through it. Uh, yes, he's a, he's, a, he's a very strong young man, and I'm, I'm confident he'll, he'll do what he has to do. Awesome. Well, we will be in prayer for him and, and your family. Um, Y'all, when you're, when you're faithful to, to doing the things that God wants you to do, you come under attack. And it can come from a lot of different places. So we will be in prayer for you and your family that you'll have strength through all of that, that the Lord will give you that uh, unimaginable peace that only comes from Him. So other prayer requests this morning. Uh, yes, sir? A prayer for Judah's son and his wife. They both came down with COVID-19. Okay. And they both need a prayer. They're very bad, very bad condition. Okay. And pray with them. 
Judith broke down, it was really severe neck, and she may have to go to see a doctor about it. She's not sure. Okay. So please be in prayer for Judith, her son Kelly, right? Kelly. Kelly and um, his wife. They both have COVID-19, and I know he's got underlying conditions that he's got to deal with there as well. So please be in prayer for Judith and uh, her son and wife. Other prayer requests this morning. Yes. Ongoing prayer for Autumn Switzer. We pray for often. Um, she recently had a, an appointment with the doctor, which she just asked some very direct questions. Remember, she's 18. She's a freshman. Just very direct questions with her doctor about is this something she's going to have to deal with her whole life. The tumors are still in her lungs. Very grown-up stuff she's having to deal with, and she's really taking it on herself to have those conversations and be in prayer and trusting the Lord in that. But just ask that God would continue to give her strength and uh, endurance and guidance and just his peace. Yes. Please be in prayer for Autumn Switzer, for her dad and mom. Uh, Lori and I had the pleasure of going to dinner with them the other night. Um, they're dealing with a lot. Her father is a pastor, uh, Gateway Community Church over in our in our neighborhood. He teaches the truth, and they're under attack. His uh, um, it's just part of of the world that we live in today. Yeah. So please be in prayer for Autumn. A praise report for Autumn is watching that young lady who, who, 18 years old, loves the Lord, loves the Lord with everything she's got. She is challenged with her health. She doesn't tell people that she has cancer, but when it does come up, it becomes an opportunity constantly, an opportunity for her to share who Christ is and who God is in her life. And it's it's pretty amazing to see. She is a uh, She's a beautiful young lady, um, inside and out, and so we will continue to be in prayer for her and her family and that church because it's, I mean, it's, they teach the truth. They teach the gospel, and it's, it's pretty awesome. Other prayer requests this morning? Chris, yes. I believe so much in prayer. I'm going to ask people to be in prayer, protection to Judith and I because while her son and, and his wife and the two of the children are going to come and stay at our house because they can't be there. They're, they're really out. And so I just pray to protect us while we're in the Absolutely. house. Absolutely. Yeah. Arms of protection around Herman and Judith, um, not only in, in the recovery from, from your health conditions, yeah. but adding that to that, the, the introduction of COVID-19. Yeah. Um, and so we want to make sure that uh, we want to get you back. <laughs> uh, we don't, uh, but the, the Lord knows what that plan is, what that looks like. Yeah. And please be in prayer for Herman and Judith as they are uh, caregiving at some level for the family in, in that as well. So, y'all, there's a lot going on in this world today. And, um, but we have our hope <coughs> anchored in the Lord. And, and that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Uh, Lori, you have something else here? Yeah, I'm picking on you. Praise report that Diani's here with us this morning. And just prayers for Clara and Diani and um, it's Diani's senior year. For all of our youth out there, we pray for every week. You know, the, just for them to finish strong and to keep their eye on the Absolutely. Keep their eye on the prize and, and focus on the Lord that he's going to get them through and trust in the Lord in that. So. Definitely. And Diani, we're glad you're here and we are in prayer for you and your mom uh, constantly. The All of the young people, please be in prayer for all of them. I mean, this whole uh, virtual learning thing, it's it's hard. It's it's not something that uh, that we're accustomed to. It's not something that the, the young people are taking to in, in a big way. There's you know we're, we're social people. They they uh, they need that social interaction. Part of the education process is that social interaction, staying engaged with what's going on in the virtual calls. And I mean I don't know if, how many of you all spend much time on Zoom. I'm on Zoom like way too many hours every day with my with my job, and it just absolutely will wear you out. Um, so please be in prayer for all the young people who right now, that's what they're doing is they're, they're learning through Zoom. Uh, I never thought that Zoom was going to be such a, a common word in the English language, but all of a sudden um, it is, and that's, that's how they're living. So please be in prayer for all of our young people and that they have the opportunity not only uh, uh, to continue to do well in their education, but they continue to, to seek out and find truth in, uh, in what's being taught in the churches. They find their 
they use the term community. They find their community uh, that's the, and their identities in Christ. And that's what we're looking for for all of them. So, any other prayer requests this morning? I have an update. Yes, ma'am. We asked for prayer for our friend Michael yes. regarding his hand and possible surgery. No surgeries were required. What has happened was it did break, though, and they missed it, and it's already healed. So it's not healed correctly. They're going to have to do some physical therapy on it. Okay. So that's a little good news because no surgery. No surgery. But it is going to be some intense therapy to oh, try to get it back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Physical therapy, that's like just legitimate the torture. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, Michael. So, praise Michael. report on Michael. He will not have to have surgery, but uh, please be in prayer for his uh, physical therapy as, as he tries to get the full use of his hand back. Let's be in prayer for Phyllis Music, one of our faithful members here. And she's just doing some battles as far as physical health. Okay. So, let's be in prayer. Yes, please. Let's all pray for Phyllis. She is a <laughs> wonderful lady. Uh, Lori spent way too many hours over the last couple of weeks. Um, not too many hours, but a lot of hours putting together the cards for the veterans. And well, Phyllis, I'm not going to tell you how. She's got several um, anniversaries of her 29th birthday. So <laughs> she sent us, I don't know, 80 something cards handmade cards for all of all of our veterans and and uh young people that we're going to be sending out uh cards for young people was it 80 something over the there were 60 for the college and there were 35 i think for the veterans yeah so, so 95 95 handmade beautiful cards and i think most all of you all saw them and signed them so thank you for that that was cool as as Laura was filling them out yesterday I could see the uh, I could see all the signatures and that was that was really neat to be able to when they open them up they'll see all the people that are praying for them for them and loving on them from Spring Valley Bible Church yes ma'am just want to share how Phyllis actually gets all the materials she she volunteers uh, at the thrift store locally uh, over in Florida so she went and combed through magazines and all stuff to get all of those pictures and little knickknacks. So what we figured out to do later on that God put upon us is that if you have a shoe box size of things and then all of those, you know, Michael's Hobby Lobby little stuff that uh, you can actually uh, use the, or even the old uh, cards, you know, that mm -hmm. can actually uh, be transferred, you know, and transformed into material for her. You know, just just drop it off in the uh, in the mail, UPS or USPS. It'll get to her. Stand by, Miss Phyllis. You may be getting a lot of packages for Christmas. <laughs> um, she loves opening them. <laughs> that's fantastic. So yes, thank you for. Uh, please be in prayer for for uh, Phyllis uh, in Florida, um, faithful member of our church, and has been just faithful to to helping us with the young people and praying. She sends notes uh, before each of the the youth group sessions about her praying individually by name for the kids that are in our youth ministry, uh, which is just phenomenal. Yes, sir. I just wanted to mention my, my one of my brothers, a uh, Vietnam vet, he got a, a card from the youth group last week and called me and just, just you guys are so awesome and thank you so much. And, and That's awesome. It meant a lot to him. That's awesome. So Good stuff. Um, so many wonderful things and in a in a year of of challenges as we look back on the things that are going on um god is god is seen in the middle of all of it we just have to open our eyes to see him so um we are donations so grace gifts we continue to turn the lights on we continue to meet in person we continue to send stuff out over the internet we have the technology we have the uh uh, the servers, we have all of the different stuff. It takes money, y'all, to put that all together and get it done. It takes time and money. Uh, your donations to the church and the continuing um, financial support is appreciated. Please uh, go to our website and uh, springvalleybiblechurch.org and you can donate there. You can send a check in. The address is there on the uh, website as well. Uh, or you can go to the website and, and hit PayPal. Um, and I'm sure at this point that Leslie... Uh, faithfully has put up our uh, address and, and link to that on the Facebook site at this point in time. So with all of these things, um, let's be in prayer. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time this morning. 
We thank you for those that are faithful to come and, and show up in person. We know that there's challenges with with health and there's challenges with uh, with COVID and there's risk and there's all these things that are going on, Father, but you said for us to congregate and that we shall do faithfully. And uh, as long as, as we can and, and you provide for us to be able to do so, sir, we will we will trust that you uh, that you have all of this under control. We thank you for the word. We thank you for this Christmas season. Uh, as we as we close out a year of 2020 that, that everybody is talking about, oh my gosh, it's the worst year ever. It's the one star on the five star scale. It's something I never want to do again. Father, you are working in all of it. And all we have to do is take the time to stop and see because you are faithful. It's your sovereign will that is playing out. You have a plan and we just need to trust you. Father, as we open your word this morning, we ask that the spirit will be with us that you will be the uh, the teacher, not me, and that, uh, that as we walk away, that uh, these things will be edifying to us and uh, glorifying to you. In Christ's name, amen. amen. And so I wanted to start, uh, if you all missed the first lesson this morning, uh, Phil spent a good amount of time talking about the, the soldiers and the army and Navy guys on the ships. And and uh, what I realized in between in between lessons here was, Phil was was subtly trying to take a dig at the Army Navy game. This day. <laughs> uh, so if you watched the if you watched the I, I couldn't understand why all of a sudden today everything was about the Army and the Navy and his teacher. <laughs> it was a pretty uh, uh, it was a good game in that uh, I think you sent the note yesterday. Um, we're, we're, we fight each other on the field, but every person on that field will be in the not too distant future putting their life on the line for the freedom of all of us. So it is an amazing game. It was a pretty boring football game, but uh, and congratulations to the Army. They didn't come out victorious. Um, I, I think we've, the Navy left its football team on the back home when they left in the buses. No, they fought hard. They played hard. Uh, but I did realize that that was what was going on this morning. So you guys can disregard Phil's lesson from this morning. Because <laughs> that's all he was doing the entire time. So. Just kidding. Not until I brought up the Navy. Yeah. yeah that is, it was a conspiracy with Pat and Phil is what was going on. But y'all know Pat, so that's not a Navy. Okay. Uh, Chris. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Leslie put out a prayer request online and said, uh, please pray for Kenny M. He had a stroke. Not sure of his status yet. Kenny M. Kenny M. And y'all, uh, pl so please be in prayer for Kenny M. Uh, he is, uh, he had a stroke and we're, we're not sure of the status, but uh, please be in prayer for him and his family. Um, on that note, it just came to mind. Um, one of our young people, Ella Ferguson, lost her father. Uh, this past week, um, he had a stroke, uh, I guess about a week and a half ago, and he passed on, uh, I'm not sure what, exactly what night it was this week, but he passed this week. And I have to, she's 18, 19 years old. Uh, she's a freshman in college. Uh, so tough time of the year for that. Uh, Any time is a tough time, but especially when you're coming into the Christmas season, because that's one of those things that just seems to hang. So please be in prayer for Ella Ferguson and her family as well. Since we're still talking about a little prayer. Hey, we're going to be praying. <laughs> Power um, prayer. Yes, sir. In prayer for my brother-in-law, had major heart surgery uh, Friday, and he's still in the hospital today, but it's been a prayer for recovery. What's his name? Dale. 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 <laughs> I must be losing my hearing if I couldn't hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, please be in prayer for Dale. Had a uh, heart surgery on Friday. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Herman's brother-in-law. Awesome. Um, today I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about Advent. It's, it's a fairly common ritual. It's a fairly common celebration in churches around the country today. Uh, we don't specifically call out the Advent um, celebration. We celebrate Christmas. We talk, we focus on the, the coming of the Lord, uh, in, in the birth of Christ at Christmas time. But as I was reading and, and looking at, at um, different things I wanted to talk about, it just kept coming back to me, Advent. Why, you know, what is this Advent celebration? So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about that this morning and then kind of 
kick off a pre-Christmas study, we'll call it. But uh, so in Advent means the anticipation of coming, the coming. In Latin, it actually means coming, right? And so many churches around the, the, the U.S., around the world for that matter, they celebrate Advent, and it's the four weeks prior to Christmas. So it's actually four, it starts four Sundays prior to Christmas. That's the Advent season. <coughs> and so instead of starting a new book right now, I'm going to start in January. I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about Advent and, and what, it, what it should mean to all of us. And the basis of the, and the background for Advent and the earliest dating of the Advent celebration is the ritual that we refer to it, uh, today. It's, it's really impossible to determine. They don't know the actual start of the celebration of Advent where they put the candles and, and they talk about the four weeks of. Um, it's actually easier to identify where Easter came from than it is for us to, to determine specifically where Advent came from. Because Christmas, I mean, uh, Easter is really tied to, it's tied to the Passover. And so Christmas came to be associated with the birth of Christ as a result of it falling during the December solstice. So we all, I think we all know here that December 25th is not the specific day of birth of Christ on the calendar. It's the day we celebrate the birth of Christ on the calendar. It's pretty funny because depending on who you talk to, that can be a, a bit of a touchy subject, but it's... It's the celebration, and it this it was put on this particular time of the year because it's the darkest day of the year in the northern hemisphere. Uh, that period of time of December, right? And so the coming of the light of the world made a lot of sense in so much darkness, and that's how we ended up with Christmas being in the December time frame is because of the December solstice, solstice and the darkness. And so within a few centuries of church history, both Easter and Christmas took on special meaning to, uh, due to their use in commemorating the life of Jesus. That's where the, the Advent started coming around, the celebration of Advent. Now, unlike modern Advent ceremonies, most, celebrates, most celebrations of Advent in the history had a, had a dual focus. There were two things historically that Advent had the Latin word advents, uh, adventus was the translation of the Greek parousia, or coming, a word used for both the coming of Christ in human flesh and of his second coming, the second advent. Then always, This always tended to be focused on, both of these were focused on in the historical advent celebrations. The coming of Christ, the birth of Christ, the celebration of, and it had been realized, and the future coming of Christ, the second advent. Both are the coming of Christ. Um, one notable lack in modern Advent celebrations, and I'm reading this from a, an article that I saw on the, on, the internet, on the internet, is the twin focus of the one notable lack in modern Advent celebrations, though, is the twin focus of both the incarnation and the second coming. Both of these themes make Advent instructive, not only historically, but also in terms of biblical theology. We are not a people who merely look to the one moment God broke into history. We await his coming again in glory when the king's reign shall be on earth as it is in heaven. So as we think about the Advent, the celebration of Advent, I thought this was starting to get pretty, really cool. If you really go back to where historically this came from, they focused on both. Well, we spent a lot of time in, in our Christmas celebration, actually, less and less time now, but generally speaking, it was the birth of Christ, the coming of Christ, the incarnate Christ, as the, the, the baby Jesus. It's pretty funny because every time I say the baby Jesus, I think of this crazy movie that uh, they pray to baby Jesus, but some of you all know what that is. In, uh... <laughs> all right, <clears throat> let, me let, me, uh, let me focus again. Um, but we are waiting on his coming glory in his incarnate, in the incarnate Christ, and in the second coming. He didn't come in his glory at Christmas, but he's coming in his full glory at his second advent, at his second coming. And so as we 
focus on Christmas. It's, it's really fun and neat and, and amazing to, to look at the, the celebration of, of the birth of Christ and the coming, and we're going to talk about these things. And, and in the Old Testament, think about the Old Testament believers and all the things that they were given in the Old Testament showing the coming of Christ. They were looking forward forward to the coming of Christ, the birth of Christ that we celebrate now that has happened, the same way that we should be looking forward to the coming of Christ, the second coming, and all that God delivered in the first deliverance of Christ on this earth that fulfilled all the prophecy, his faithfulness, his plan, everything that was laid out, that's where we, we see that it happened, and that's where we have our hope. God did this. God did this. He delivered what he said he would deliver. The same way we should be looking to the second advent, the second coming, knowing he will deliver. And that is our hope. That's our hope as we look at Christmas. And so the tradition actually starts the fourth Sunday of, uh, before Christmas. It's four weeks of Advent. And typically there's candles involved. And I think it, it's cool. They come in, they light the candle, and it kind of focuses you on what they're talking about. I didn't think that it would be a good idea to leave candles burning in here because I just think it would be a bad idea if we take off, we don't come back for a week, and who knows what happens to the building while the candles are burning. So, but it's really, it's, it's the reenacting, these four... These four themes, it's the reenacting of the anticipation of the coming Savior. Each work, each week, has a candle associated with it or a theme associated with it. And the first week is hope. The first week of the Advent is focused on hope. The second one is focused on peace. The third week is joy. And the fourth week is love. And those are the four themes of Advent that's celebrated in, in a lot of churches these days. And so this, this service is not a, a lesson on the ritual of Advent, but I want to take a, a, a beautiful celebration of the coming of our Lord, the incarnation and the second coming, and spend some time focusing on the four themes of the Advent service. But first I wanted to start with, as we prepare to kick this study off, um, we're going to spend some time moving through scriptures. So does everybody have a Bible because you're going to want one, or at least an electronic version? Because we're going to look at some scriptures today in preparation for the celebration of the coming Savior. But I wanted to start, if you'll turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, and I think many of you probably already know this by heart. And I'm going to give you time to turn to these because I, I, I think there's, there's power and there's joy in reading the Word of God together. And so in Hebrews 4.12, I want to start with, the, for the word, word of God is alive and it's active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. But the Word of God is alive and powerful. And so I'm going to spend very little time defining, exegeting all of these passages we go through. I'll make some comments. I'll try to add some clarification. But I wanted to spend this morning and next week prior to Christmas, the week before Christmas celebration, reading some scriptures about the coming of our Savior. And so we're reading a lot of scriptures. Um, as we approach the reading of these scriptures, as we've talked about over the last couple of uh, books that we've been I've been teaching on, we read it with humility, we read it with expectation, and we read it in the power of the Spirit. So let's start this, this morning, the anticipation of the coming of the Lord, by reading Isaiah 9, Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. It 
It starts with, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation, increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. I know we've read all this before. I know everybody in here has read this, this at some point in time. The Old Testament scriptures, the prophets, point forward to the coming of the Lord, the birth of Christ, and the eternal reign of Christ. At Christmas, we celebrate the fulfillment of what the Old Testament believers longed to see. That was something that was really kind of powerful to me as I was sitting and reading these scriptures. Is The Old Testament believers were looking to the coming of Christ, the first advent. We know it. We celebrate it. They were looking forward to it. I just think that was kind of cool. We celebrate the faithfulness of our Heavenly Father on Christmas. Just like we studied while in the book of Peter, the Lord was very specific about the details of the coming Christ. We talked about this in Peter. He doesn't tell us when, but he tells us how this is going to happen. He tells us what the second coming is going to look like. He tells us what the things are going to be that are in place, that are going to happen as Christ returns. He did the same thing in the Old Testament with the Old Testament believers before the first coming of Christ. The coming of the, the Messiah in verse 1 of this of uh, Psalm, sorry, Isaiah chapter 9. God humbled the northern kingdom, Zebulun and Naphtali, for a while. So in 732 BC, the northern kingdom, Zebulun and Naphtali are in the northern kingdom, was conquered by Assyria. 732 BC. And he says, we will honor Galilee of the nations. That's the Assyrian-controlled province. This is the same area where Jesus spent most of his time growing up and much of his ministry. Jesus honored this area with his presence. And it says, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, this was a major international route that Assyria used as they entered the northern kingdom. This is documented in Egyptian and Assyrian records. It's not in the Bible that they used this route. But they used this route on their conquest. Well, this is the same direction from which the Messiah comes and wipes away the gloom of the Gentile domination. This is the same way that Christ comes in. And then verse 2, the effects of the Messiah. The people were in darkness, but they saw a great light. The light has dawned. Jesus is the light of the world. In John 8, 12, it says Jesus was talking. And then Jesus again spoke to them and says, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In verse 3 through 5, increasing of the joy, the supernatural results of the filling of the Spirit, just as Midian's victory was a supernatural victory. 
Remember that as we read this, the church age was a mystery to the Old Testament believers. They were anticipating the coming of the Lord and the eternal reign of Christ at the same time. Think about that. I mean, sometimes I stop and wonder how the Pharisees could have missed it, right? How all of these religious people, I mean, I, I know because it happens today. Christ came and people still don't believe it. Christ, we can see the effects of God everywhere. And they, we still don't believe it, as it says in, in uh, Romans chapter 1. You know, the evidence is all there. So it's not a matter of, of physical evidence. It's not a matter of seeing it. But I oftentimes think, as I'm thinking about the, the, the uh, Pharisees and the, the religious people in, in, uh, in Israel at the time, as they're looking towards the coming of the Lord, they were looking for both of these things to happen. As, as Phil talked about this morning, they, weren't, they thought that their own self-righteousness had got them over the sin part. They were looking for Christ to come and be the conqueror and, re and redeem them from, from Roman rule and set up the eternal kingdom. That, that was, well, they missed the part where, oh, by the way, he's got to die for the sins of the world because our sins are, have not yet been paid for. We cannot be good enough. And so in verse 6 and 7, the prophecy of the coming incarnate Christ is written out in verse 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of this government, of the, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So you can see where the advent, the coming, and the, the coming and the celebration is focused on both Christ's return, I mean Christ's coming, and ultimately Christ's return. And the prophecy of the coming incarnate Christ in this particular case, Isaiah was written somewhere around 700 BC, 720, 730, but generally speaking, 700 years before Christ came. To us, a child is born. And so as I was thinking about how did they miss this stuff, well, we'll think where we are today as believers even, as we look towards the coming, the second coming. A lot of stuff has happened since Christ left. Well, think about all the stuff that happened between the time Isaiah lays out the prophecy and the time Christ returned. I mean, Christ shows up, the incarnate Christ. The Babylon captivity, the fall of Jerusalem, Daniel and his friends in exile under Nebuchadnezzar, the fall of Babylon to Cyrus, the Persians, the return from Babylon and the rebuilding of the temple, rise of the Roman Empire, Alexander the Great, a Maccabean War, Roman rule over Jerusalem, and then 400 years of silence before Christ returns. All of these things, God is not slow in his, he will deliver things in his time. But the anticipation of the coming Lord, the first advent, as, as these things are laid out before us in the Old Testament, as the prophecies are laid out before us, we can put our hope in these things. We know, we saw how the prophecy was laid out. We saw how it was fulfilled. And so we can see the faithfulness of God. The Old Testament believers were looking forward. When's it going to happen? When are they going to come? When is Jesus going to show up? When is our Savior going to be here? And now we look back on it in celebration and look forward to the second advent. And we have the same questions. When's he going to come? When's it going to happen? What do I need to be prepared for? How am I going to live my life? All of the same things that the Old Testament believers were looking for. But the anticipation of the coming of the Lord in the first advent brings hope. That's the first week of the advent celebration. So if you look at Psalm 31, turn to Psalm 31 for me. And we're going to do Psalm 31, 21 through 24. Praise be to the Lord for he showed me the wonders of his love when I was in a city under siege. 
In my alarm, I said, I am cut off from your sight. Yet you heard my cry for mercy when I called to you for help. Love the Lord, all his faithful people. The Lord preserves those who are true to him. But the proud he pays back in full. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Man, that could be like today looking for the second coming. Praise be to the Lord, for he showed me the wonders of his love when I was in a city under siege. Every one of us, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, are under siege. Isaiah 40. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40. And we're going to read, starting at verse 28. Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives strength to the weary, and to the one who lacks might, he increases power. Though youth grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who hope in the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up on the wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Our hope, our hope is in the Lord. Ephesians 1.8 says, I pray that, excuse me, Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 119, 114, you are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Psalm 135, Psalm 130, verse 5. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. The Old Testament believers were looking forward to the hope of Christ. We look forward to the hope of his return. The coming of the Messiah brought hope. The coming of the Messiah is our confidence. The coming of the Messiah brings peace. Not peace on this earth, but peace to the believers. The second coming brings peace to the earth. The first coming brings peace to the believers. Isaiah 9, 6, which we read a moment ago. So I won't ask you to turn back there. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Luke 2, 14 Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among people with whom he is pleased. Who is that? It doesn't say peace among people, period. It says peace among people with whom he is pleased. There will be peace among believers. Peace with God in the believer. That should give us all peace. <laughs> John 14, 25. These things I have spoken to you while remaining with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of all that is I said to you. Peace I leave you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled nor fearful. You heard that I said to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would re have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. The realization of the prophecy of Christ, the birth of our Savior, should give every one of us peace in knowing with confidence that he is coming again. I am going away, and I am coming to you. John 14, 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I am coming again 
and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you will also be. We will be with Christ. It's his promise. It's our peace. God declared the coming of Jesus from the beginning of man in Genesis 1, and he fulfilled that promise. This should give us peace. The coming of the Messiah also brings joy. One of the predominant themes of, of the Psalms is that of the, of the Messiah. Almost 10% of the Psalms, I think 16 of the 150 Psalms, you can Google that if you want to know. 16 of the 150 Psalms are classified as messianic. Don't Google it too many times because they might shut down your account. No, I'm just kidding. That was a totally political side note. Um, but in sincerity, the 16 of the 150 Psalms are classified as messianic Psalms. And if you want the list of those, if you would like to read them, I will. it's Psalm 2, Psalm 8, 16, 22, 23, 24, 40, 41, 45, 68, 69, 72, 89, 102, 110, and 118. That would be some pretty cool reading each night before uh, during the Christmas season. And uh, in addition, many of the other Psalms, while not strictly messianic in nature, ref they refer to Christ in some way. The various writers related much about his person, his life, or his rejection, suffering, and resurrection. The messianic Psalms were often quoted and further explained in the New Testament. As we've studied and as we go through the New Testament, all kinds of references back to the Psalms. Psalm 110 says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make enemies of your footstool. Sorry, make enemies a footstool for your feet. <laughs> Got to read that correctly. <laughs> Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Psalm 110. <clears throat> and so will you turn with me to Psalm 51? We'll read this one together. Cut that pause out there, Julie, so we don't turn the thing off. That's a long one. Yeah, that was a long one. <laughs> Psalm 51. I have to say, uh, in between in order to, uh, to prevent the system from turning itself off. <laughs> Psalm 51. Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithfulness. According to the greatness of your compassion, wipe out my wrongdoings. Wash me thoroughly from guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my wrongdoings, and my sin is constantly before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in guilt, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in secret you will make wisdom known to me. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Cleanse me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear your joy and gladness. Let the bones you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and wipe out all my guilty deeds. Create in me a clean heart, God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Respect Store me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> our joy isn't dependent on what's going on in our life or in the world 
or the people that we are with. It doesn't depend on the gifts we give or the gifts we find under the tree. No earthly thing can ever give us true joy. Our joy comes from God. That joy that flooded the hearts of the shepherds, the angels, the wise men, the host of heaven, and Mary and Joseph is the joy that still has the power to overwhelm our hearts with rejoicing. The coming of the Lord brought great joy. We talked about this last week with our, our young people, which was pretty awesome. Um, the joy that was, that was seen amongst all that came to see Christ in his birth, came to see Jesus as he's born in the manger, the humble child born in the manger, our Savior. But we looked at it as we're going through that. All of creation, all of creation was represented. The angels sang. The lowest of the low, the shepherds, rejoiced. The Jews, right? They were Jewish. The Gentiles, the Magi, the rich, the poor, the beasts, all were represented. They all rejoiced in the coming of our Lord. Luke 2. Now Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was betrothed to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes, cloths, and laid him in a manger, because he, there was no room for him at the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over the flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood near them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. And so the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly army of angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on peace among people with whom he is pleased. When the angels had departed from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem. And see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen him, they made known the statement which had been told to them about Christ, about this child. And all who heard it were amazed about the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen just as they had been told. The coming of the Lord brought great joy. The coming of the Lord will bring great joy. The coming of the Lord also brought love. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Romans 8, 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. With those as the backdrop, turn to Isaiah 53. We have read this many a time, but it can never be read enough. As we look forward to the coming of the birth of Christ in our Christmas celebration, we would be remiss in not thinking about why he was here. Isaiah 53, who has believed our message and to whom has the army of arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, 
and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with, wicked, with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And he will and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So we come into this season of celebrating the birth of our Lord. Let's not forget that what we celebrate was an anticipation of the Old Testament believers, the anticipation of the coming of the Lord of the Messiah. Today we know that Christ has come, and we know that he bore the sins of the world on his body. We celebrate in this dark time the light coming into the world. We celebrate the whole earthly ministry of Christ and we celebrate the love of God and that he sent his son to this earth to be a sacrifice for each one of us. We celebrate the sovereign will of God that despite all of the resistance, all of the things that were in place to stop it, the Savior came and is coming again. For many, the Christmas season is not a season of hope, peace, joy, and love. That's true for Christians as well, not just unbelievers. It is a season of darkness. Even for many of us who believe the Lord is our Savior, have times of depression, sadness, feeling lonely or lost, especially during the Christmas season. I don't know what it is about the Christmas season. that It's rampant. But as we celebrate Christmas, let's keep our eyes focused not just on the birth of our Savior, but what the birth of our Savior brought as a gift from God. That's our gift. He demonstrated the faith, it demonstrated the faithfulness of God. The birth of Jesus Christ and the fulfillment of prophecies demonstrates the faithfulness of our God. He is God. Only he could make it happen. We couldn't do this. Man couldn't do this. It demonstrated that God is in control. For all the things that were put in place to stop the coming of the Messiah, it happened just as God planned it. It demonstrated the love of God. The birth of Jesus Christ demonstrated the love of God, that he would send his son to be man. It provided for our salvation. The coming of Christ provided for our salvation in his death on the cross. It brought joy to those who believe. It provided peace in our souls. It brought hope to a dark world. In this Christmas season, my prayer for all of us is that the Holy Spirit will help us stay focused on the hope and not the darkness. We have the hope. Who are we sharing it with? John 8, 12. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's a promise. Follow him, and we will never walk in darkness. Follow Jesus, and we will never walk in darkness. Next week, we'll do some reflecting on the faith of the Old Testament believers looking at the coming of Christ and what that should look like for us as we anticipate the, come, the second coming of our Lord. 
May God bless the reading of his word, and may it be a blessing to each one of us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the prophecies that you gave to the Old Testament believers, to the prophets that proclaimed the coming of your son. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the fulfillment of that prophecy, the birth of Christ as we prepare to celebrate Christmas, the celebration of Jesus' birth. We look forward to the Passover and the death of Christ on the cross and the celebration of our salvation through his work. Father, we look forward to the second coming when his return, when he brings righteousness, he brings glory, he brings himself to us. Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. We ask that all of these things will be glorifying to you and edifying to our souls in this Christmas season. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.